So for those of you who have been absent most of the trip or have been asleep, I'm going to cover where is Polynesia. Polynesia is a sub-region of Oceania. You'll see it right here in the Polynesian Triangles, made up of over 1,000 islands scattered across the South Pacific. And the largest country is New Zealand. It was also the last country to be peopled about 1280 to 1300. New Zealand is also one of the marking points of the Polynesian Triangle. You can see it from here, New Zealand going north to Hawaii and then back east again to Easter Island, keeping Fiji out of the center, which is part of Melanesia. Let's talk about Polynesian religions. While there's a great deal of diversity throughout Polynesia, what's unique is that despite there being volcanic islands, continental islands, and coral atolls, most of the beliefs of the people of Polynesia are relatively homogenous. You can go from one island to the next to another and see that their beliefs, their language systems, their gods, while they might change pronunciation a bit, most of their beliefs remain largely intact and homogenous throughout this entire region. And keep in mind that this region comprises over 10 million square miles of land. These include closely linked languages, social groups, political organizations, and religious beliefs, and ceremonies. Throughout all of these islands, you'll see great similarities in these. While many of these beliefs have survived, most of them have been changed by Christianity. So, in essence, the beliefs and the faith that we're going to be talking about this morning no longer exist in the pure form. They have since been changed. Conversion to Christianity began in the 19th century, and by about 1850, most of these island groups had been converted to Christianity, although some islands were not converted until the 1950s. The goal today for me, and hopefully for you, is to make this lesson relevant, is to try to connect these people, their beliefs, their understandings of the world and their God and themselves and how they relate to each other, to try to connect it to your own life and to your own faith beliefs. And if you're not people of faith, that's okay too. Try to see how it impacts people of faith and how it might be similar to other religions and faiths that you know and understand. The first group we're going to talk about is the Kapinga Mirangi. Say that three times fast. It's, this is an island located to the south of the Caroline Island groups. And now, while this is distinctly outside of the Polynesian Triangle, the beliefs and the actions and the rituals and the makeup of these people is very much distinctly Polynesian. Every day, just before sunset, the gods would come from the ocean, walk up to shore, and a priest would call out an invitation to the gods inviting them into the holy house. They would enter the house. They would open the screens at one end. The gods would enter. They would close the screens. And then the priest would go about his prayers, welcoming the gods, inviting them to spend the night to protect their island and to be present to them as they slept. And then after their evening prayers, they would close the screens again and the gods then would spend the night. In the morning, the priest would then open the screens again, do his prayers, and let the gods back out into the ocean. And then the next afternoon, just before sunset, this would happen all over again. In a similar way, almost to the Sabbath service, where this happens at sunset, and the gods are invited, God is invited to partake in this to be part of this memory, memorable event, this is the similar sort of a feeling that these gods are invited in, invited to stay the night, to be present to the people and to protect them until the next day when they came again. There are some basic elements of, elements of Polynesian faith. 
And despite all of the differences throughout Polynesia, there are a few of them that remain relatively constant. One is that the gods inhabit a realm distinct from the human world and populated by human beings. So they live in a world completely distinct from us, apart from our foibles and our quirks. They're transcendent, if you will. But being transcendent, they're also frequent visitors to this world. So when called upon, they will come down, and sometimes when they're not called upon, they will come down anyway in the form of nature. The great gods are responsible for much of what happens in the physical realm, whether through prayers or through nature, through anger, through jealousy. These are things that the gods often feel because like the Greek gods, they're not only good, they're also jealous, they're angry, they're petty. They have all of these things that make us human which helps, them, uh, helps humans understand where they received it from. But the one difference is that these gods have immortality. They'll live forever. So their foibles won't be their downfall as they will be for us. Humans may exercise through properly executed ritual, prayers, and incantations some control over the visits of these gods. And isn't that what prayer is, right? To ask God to come into our life to help in one respect, to assist in another. And then they ask the gods to leave. One of the interesting parts is that the gods may be ritually asked to withdraw. So inasmuch as you invite God to be present to you in your time of need, you can ask, also ask God after your time of need is finished or after the required visit has been fulfilled by the God, you can ask that God to leave when his presence is no longer desirable. Polynesian religion tells of gods who are immensely active in this world. And we'll see the same sorts of things throughout many types of ancient mythologies, particularly the Greeks, that the gods were in fact transcendent, but they involved themselves in our worlds for one particular purpose, and that was to create myth, to teach us legend. There are very few myths that talk about the gods' involvement. They were jealous. Even Zeus was, was unfaithful to his wives. And we have all these different stories about the fighting on Olympus. But the really interesting stories are the stories of when the gods come down to earth and interact with us. And those become the fodder for myths. They become the fodder for today's religion. And their prayers, these Polynesians would pray to invite the gods and then to expel them at the same time. Creation stories exist to help us explain our beginnings. This is a fundamental human trait. We want to know who we are and where we come from. It's almost impossible for us to know who we truly are unless we know where we come from. Consider today how popular Ancestry.com and Genealogy.com are. We knew 75 years ago, our parents knew who we were. They didn't need to understand 200 or 300 or 400 years back. And yet today we desire this with all our hearts. We want to know what is our bloodline? Where do we come from? Because in helping understand where we come from, it helps us understand who we are. And that's very important about the creation stories as well. Where did we come from? Is there a creator God? And when we can go all the way back to the beginning, it helps us understand who we are to a greater degree. There are some interesting cosmological arguments. We could spend the next several weeks talking about cosmology arguments, and it would largely come down to one or two arguments. And so I'll spare you all of the long conversations, and we'll get to the nitty-gritty. A cosmological argument in natural theory and natural philosophy is an argument in which we argue about the cause or the existence of God. It's traditionally known as an argument of first cause or a causal origin argument. And there are three different variants of these arguments. The first one is called inesse, essential, essentiality. And this one compares us to the light of a candle. So imagine that you are the flame of a candle and that God is the wick. You could not have been created without God and you cannot exist without God, the wick. 
So the flame is sustained, was created by, and is sustained by God. Now an atheist will use that argument right back against you and say, but in like form, if there was no flame, is there any need for the wick? Right? And so it's a causal argument. This is called essentiality. And Fieri is about becoming. And this argument goes back to the beginning where we say, if you were a builder and you built a house, the builder can walk away and the house still stands. Or the watchmaker argument. The watchmaker makes the watch, starts it in motion, and the watch continues in motion because it's been set in motion. The watchmaker can now walk away and that watch continues to function. And so this talks about the process of becoming in fieri. And then the last one in causa, causality. And this one takes us back to the first cause. Aristotle believed that, well, he, first of all, I don't think he wanted to get caught up in this idea of a universe of a beginning and an end, because it requires then an uncaused cause. So what he talked about is there being several planes of existence, and in these planes that there were several unmoved movers. So you can say unmoved mover, uncaused cause. And in the world of infinite regression, if you say that we are the created, that the earth was created, that there must then be what? A creator, right? And while that's a very simple and easy argument, if we take it to the point of infinite regression, what happens is then we say, okay, God created the earth and humans. Who created God? And then you say, well, if there was another God, then who created that God? And then who created that God? And then who created that God? And then back into infinity because it's an infinite regression to the point that at some point or another there must be something that is an uncaused cause or an unmoved mover, something that sets all things in motion. And so the understanding is that God, in most people's understanding, God is and was and always will be God is the eternal. In these ancient people, they couldn't understand that. And so when we look at the stories of creation, we see that the earth always was and always will be. Same thing in Greek mythology. We have Uranus and we have Gaia, the mother earth and father sky. And then they gave birth to the Titans and then the Titans gave birth to the gods. And so we see here the similar arguments, but these are our arguments today. But in Polynesia, what is the uncaused cause? And so their mythology starts off their universe with its spiritual and physical realms, its myriads of gods, human beings, plants, and animals, was established by a series of creative acts. Okay, is this is sounding familiar to any of you? It'll start to click in a little bit. Myths from Samoa and the Society all Islands all tell us of an uncreated creator God who was stirred to create the beginnings of the world. In other myths, this spark of creation is a series of abstract mental qualities, perhaps remembrance, consciousness, and desire. And consider and compare it to the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And in that, John is talking about Jesus. And of course now we see that this is an abstraction. A word is an abstraction. It doesn't exist. But the word was God. The word was with God. And the word was throughout all times and always will be. It existed from the beginning and will be through the end. In most Polynesian accounts of creation, existence was soon differentiated into a male sky and a female earth. They came together to copulate and to create. And the earth gave birth to many sons, the major gods of the Polynesian pantheon. So keep in mind now when we talk about these many gods, for those of you who are believers in the Judeo-Christian tradition, I'm going to share something with you that might be quite a surprise. And I'm going to take it back one step pre-Judaism into Canaanism, Canaanite religion. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Their numbers and identities of these male and female gods differ, but their names are Tane, Tu, Tangaroa, and they appear in different linguistic forms throughout Polynesia. Prior to the gods Yahweh, there were the Canaanite gods. The father of Yahweh is El Elyon. And when we look at the scriptures, El is a way of talking about God in a generic format. Elyon is most high. So when we see El Elyon, we see God most high. So when those of you are reading in the Hebrew scriptures, and you'll see the phrase God most high, this is what it was written in the original text, El Elyon. And El Elyon separated mankind into 70 nations. And to those 70 nations, his 70 sons, he gave, he gave those 70 sons, his 70 gods. And so these are the 70 gods, the 70 sons of El. And this is from the Ugaridic texts. These were found in the 1920s. Each of these sons is the deity, the tutelary deity of one of the 70 nations. One of these sons was Yahweh. So now imagine we have 70 tribes. And one of these tribes is the tribe of Judah. And Judah is a warrior tribe, the tribe of Judah, which becomes Judaism. They're a warrior tribe. And they want to win. They want to be this powerful tribe. And so when they are looking at the gods and they talk about these gods, they choose their tutelary god, as the god of war, so that they can be a powerful, powerful tribe. And so all of the other tribes, these 69 other tribes, were destroyed or lost or never heard from again. And so in time, the god of war that we know as Yahweh became the only god of the Bible. What's intriguing about this is the idea that when we think about God, it means that God had a father in these terms. And what that draws us back to again is this uncaused cause. It continues back in time. And so it was a very interesting understanding. And I share this because it helps us understand a little bit more how our roots were founded in polytheism and how the beginnings of the Hebrew scriptures were very much about telling the people of Moses that you should believe in only one God. I am the Lord your God. There shall be no other gods before me. This is the first commandment. Now, if that wasn't important, why would they say it? It's important because the people until that time had been polytheistic. In fact, when Moses comes down from the mountain, what does he see? He sees Aaron and all of the people worshiping the golden calf again. And so he's only been up there for a short period of time and he comes down and he says, hey you guys, we just got delivered and now you guys are going back to this golden calf again. I've only been gone a short period and you've melted down all of your gold and are worshiping this calf. And so these commandments are important because they help guide us. And in the same way, we talk about the Polynesian creation story. The Sky Father was pressed closely to Earth Mother in the beginning. The living space between them was dark and cramped and their sons could scarcely stand upright. And the sons resolved to separate their parents and it was Tane Mohuta, the god of the forest, who eventually separated his parents apart and allowed creation to see light. So it was Tane Mohuta who perhaps said, let there be light. This is a mythological source for the idea that existence is divided into the spiritual and the physical realm. When Tane Mahuta pushed the Sky Father into heaven, that became the spiritual realm. And then the Earth Mother turned over on her back and curled into a ball to become the Earth. And that became the physical realm. Further stages of creation are defined by genealogy. So in Polynesia, we'll also see an attempt to explain where we come from through genealogy. In a Samoan myth, various sorts of rocks and plants and animal species are born and they mate and they produce other offspring through, they create other objects through their offspring. So if they knew that water and sun and rocks existed, then the water and the sun and the rocks got together and they copulated and gave birth to other objects and other forms of life. And this is how they explained through a genealogical form how all life came into being. In the ninth generation, interestingly, 
Pili the lizard mates with a tropical bird. Again, lizard on the earth, bird in the sky. And their three sons and daughter are the first human beings. So it's only in the ninth generation after the sun and the moon and the water and the stars and the plants and all of these other lives have been created that this life now gives birth to the first humans. In the mythology of the Maori of New Zealand, the progenitor is the god Tani. He's the creator god. And so unable to create alone, he seeks an uha. And having found many of them, he joins with them, forms his physical union, and then from these unions is born water and the various species of insects, birds, and trees, and other plants. But throughout all of this, he was dissatisfied because he was unable to create humans. He and his brothers, the sons of the sky and the earth, then shaped a woman from clay from the earth. And Tane breathed life into her nostrils, mouth, and ears. And unsure if she was alive, this is where the story gets interesting, he copulated with the various orifice and orifices and crevices of her body. You can all make faces, I agree. But this was the origin of the bodily excretions. So they helped explain where does our mucus come from our nose? Where does our saliva come from? Where does this earwax come from in our tears? Well, it all comes from the secretions from Tane, the first god. And then, at last, he finally got the picture, and he tried her genitals. And then they had a daughter, and her name was Hinititama. And then later on, Tane took his daughter and mated with her, and from there gave birth to the first human beings. So even the mother, Hinetetama, was above human beings. She wasn't quite a god, but she wasn't a human being either, but she gave birth to those humans. So then we can compare to the two versions of the creation story in Genesis. In the first story, God created man and woman from clay. And in this first story also, what's interesting is to note the uses of the word God. In the original scriptures, the, the word is used Elohim to describe God. And Elohim is a general term for meaning God's almost in a generic sense. And then in the second creation story is used Yahweh, which is now a personal relationship with this God. And so we have two different, we'll read about it in our scriptures and we'll see it as just God. But in the original verses, it was Elohim in the first and Yahweh in the second. And so there's a distinction here already. We're talking about two different stories. And the first story starts with water, that there was water covered all things. And the second story was a dry wasteland. And then the water came. So while these elements come, they come at different points and times. And the story was meant to give us a different idea of creation because obviously there was no way of knowing. And so depending on how you read these scriptures, you can either see them as a continuation from one to the next. But in both of them, what we see here is very plainly that God in one came down, created man and woman together <clears throat> from clay. And in the second one, he created Adam, and then from Adam he took a rib and then formed Eve and breathed life into her. So these same stories now, whether it's from the Hebrew scriptures or the Greek myths to the Polynesian myths are all very similar. Maui and other heroes throughout Polynesia put the finishing touches on creation. <clears throat> so even when we recognize, if they recognize that the great God, Yo, created all that was, some things simply weren't right because those gods weren't completely perfect either. They made some mistakes. And so we hear the story about Maui, for those of you who are at the other lecture, the sun used to go through the sky way too quickly and it would burn the crops because it was burning too hot and it wouldn't give people enough time to do their chores, to be able to go out and do their work. And so consequently, Maui emerges from, the, from his underworld at dawn and creates a snare for the sun. And when he snares the sun, he beats it with the jawbone of a female ancestor and he weakens it. He breaks the sun's legs. And so afterwards, after Maui has handled the sun, the sun now moves 
at a slow pace across the sky, allowing enough time for everyone to do their chores, to do their laundry, and so it's not so hot during the day. And we owe all of that to Maui. The spiritual realm was populated by many beings, uh, by most islands, and some variant of the term Atua was used. So when we talk about gods in a general form, the Polynesians used the word Atua. Some gods lived as humans. Some gods lived as humans. Some gods have never lived as humans. Consider that they're the sons of the earth and the sky. Some are just spirits of deceased ancestors. Stillborn babies would qualify as those. Some gods are benevolent and others are mischievous and some are downright malevolent. So consider again a comparison here with Norse mythology. We would have the gods who are not necessarily gods of something, but Thor was the god of lightning. He was lightning. And so we see now Loki is the god of mischief, the god of joking. So he got into trouble. So we see Maui is very similar to Loki in Norse mythology. And the gods have a diverse range of occupations and interests. They're just like us. There are creator gods. There are departmental gods that are responsible for the forest, for cultivated plants, for the ocean. There are gods of particular tribes and even gods of particular families. That's how we get into 400,000 gods when we're talking about Polynesia. And that doesn't even compare with the gods of Hinduism. I did a lecture on the 33 million gods of Hinduism, and in that lecture I remembered starting out, the 33 million gods of Hinduism. Number one. <laughs> I got the exact same response. So there are gods of warfare, fishing, carpentry, and other occupations, and even gods that specialize in certain diseases because if you wanted to be cured of a certain disease or if you wanted someone to contract a certain disease, you needed to pray to that specific god. While the gods lived and were transcendent in the spiritual realm, they would also come down to earth and visit us in the forms of nature, and they would also create and be a part of our lives by partnering with other human beings. The gods were the authors of our dreams and of our human artistic accomplishments. They underwrote and were responsible for just about everything. So if you were brave, you owed that to a god. If you were a coward, you owed that equally to a god. If you were ill, you could blame that on the god. But if you were successful, you couldn't take the credit because that was also due to a god. How similar do we think today uh, that we, we still do and we think in these same manners, giving much of this credit to god? Some events that Polynesians attributed to the gods are recorded by Augustus Earle during his voyage from, Aust from New Zealand to Australia in 1828. And he wrote, The second day after we were at sea, I saw a group of savages lying around the binnacle, all intently occupied in observing the phenomenon of the magnetic attraction. They seemed at once to comprehend the purpose to which it was applied, and I listened with eager curiosity to their remarks upon it. This, they said, is the white man's god who directs them safely to different countries and then can guide them home again. So what these people saw as a god, we saw as an instrument, as a tool, and they saw it as magic and something that came straight from the gods to protect them. Polynesians believed that the gods instigated most of the minutiae of their life, that the god was responsible for all things at all times in all places in all things that were happening. And so this led the Polynesians to see events as messages from gods. And dreams were equally important. One spirit or soul could leave the body and sleep, rise above, and travel, and then return to the body in the morning with news of what was happening in the area. And as you can imagine, this person became very popular, particularly if they were right. A Maori woman dreamt that raiders were gathering in the hills to attack her village, and this was confirmed when the scouts found that raiders were indeed in the hills. Of a Maori man dreamt of skulls lying on the ground and decorated with feathers, it was a sign that was, his wife was pregnant. The colors of the feathers foretold the sex of the baby. 
What we don't know is what colors meant which. We can assume it probably wasn't pink and blue. But when we talk about the significance of dreams, this is even important in the Hebrew scriptures when we see that the Pharaoh has these dreams and he can't figure out what it means. So he dreams of these seven cows that are emaciated. He dreams of these seven stalks of corn that are withered and dying. And he doesn't know what it means. And so he calls to Jacob's son, Joseph, who's in prison. He says, Joseph, can you help me with this? I have a little bit of experience with this. I played Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream code. I was Joseph in the high school musical. Uh, so I could do the whole song and dance act for you. I'm going to save you, however, because you can hear my voice. But Joseph comes and he says, seven years of good fortune are on your way. But after this, you're going, to, you're going to have seven years of famine. So it's important in these next seven years to stock up and to create stores. And so that's what happens. And it's told then that the Pharaoh saves enough and that there's enough food for all of the lands. And Joseph is then um, elevated, his status is elevated from that of a slave to being the vizier, the number two man under the Pharaoh. How significant. So divination was also used in Polynesia. Tribal priests in Tahiti would read the outcome of a proposed battle in the entrails of sacrificial animals. This was also done by the Celts. This was done by some sects of Persians as well. The configurations of rainbows and clouds and other heavenly phenomena were also understood as omens. How many of you believe that the rainbow is the sign of the covenant from, from Noah? This is all a part of this, this idea that there were signs that were given to us by the gods and we wanted to make sense of them. This is how they made sense of those signs and those omens. Should a Maori party, war party see the moon situated above the evening star, they would abandon the plans to attack the next day. However, if the moon was situated below the evening star, it would be a sign that they would attack with success. Consider Emperor Constantine, the emperor who made Christianity the formal religion of Rome, pushing away polytheism. When he went into battle at the bridge of Milvian, he looked up into the sky and he saw the cross in the sun. And so he saw that as a sign that Jesus was on his sign. And so he had his flag emblazoned with the chiro. And they went into battle. And the battle was successful. And he won. And from that point forward, Christianity was no longer a tolerated religion in the Roman Empire. It became the religion of the Roman Empire. All of the other religions were thrown out. Persian goddess Mithra was a popular goddess at the time throughout uh, Rome <clears throat> and altars and churches that had been established. All of those churches were emptied of Mithraic icons and Christians took them over and consequently the makeup of our churches today is largely in the same format of that of the Mithraic temples from the third century after Christ. So it's interesting these connections that we see but that signs have been trusted by cultures and peoples throughout all times and it was no different for these people. They also believed in human possession, that gods were actually thought to inhabit human beings and change their physicality to change the way they spoke, and that this would often be a reason for mischief, um, for disease, so they would feel a pinch in their organs. And this was a god who was inside, it was pinching them. And so they were often used that this idea of human possession was the reason to explain disease, or spiritual possession was also another way to explain mental imbalance. Some were prone to spirit possession, by which a spirit, or a god, or an ancestor would communicate. And the medium would go into a trance and would often speak in a different chain of voice. For those of you who are familiar with the movies like The Exorcist <clears throat> and other types of exorcisms, this is a common occurrence when a devil or a spirit takes over a person's body. This was the voice of God, possessing God, conveying information that was important to them about some disease or about something that would be important for the community. Humans weren't the only ones to be possessed. Animals were also possessed. Sharks, herons, lizards, owls. 
And because the gods were often malicious, they would explain then these activities, the, the scary activities of these animals. These animals were regarded with fear because they thought were, were thought to be possessed by God. Lizards were particularly thought to be used by malevolent gods. And so consequently, people fear lizards throughout much of Polynesia, even today. Persons, places, and things that were possessed or were otherwise under the influence of God were either mana or tapu. If you had mana, you were favored by the gods. You were a person who had this great spiritual presence and wealth, and you were favored by the gods. This was also applied to certain weapons, very similar to like Excalibur, the magical sword of King Arthur, that if you had a particular tool that was filled with mana, you were, you were um, uh, unbeatable in the field of battle. Individuals who achieved outstanding accomplishments such as warriors or priests or artists, they all had mana. Mana also was attributed to certain lines and descent lines. So Polynesian society was highly stratified. So there was a great deal of difference between the high priests and the chiefs and the lowest people. Consider too that even in the genealogies of the gospels, it was important that the gospel writers established the genealogy of Jesus to show that he came from the house of David. So genealogy here is also important that if there was someone who was very high in the chiefly line or the priestly line, that you wanted to show that you were related to that person because that manna was passed down from generation to generation through firstborn children. So these lines trace their descent back to the high gods themselves. And this is common throughout many faiths of our own time today. In Tahiti, high chiefs were carried on the back of servants whenever they ventured out because if their feet touched the ground, that place would be sacred. And it couldn't be used for ordinary purposes anymore. Consider today, even when you go into Jerusalem, there are three churches for just about every place that Jesus set foot or for where Muhammad stepped. It's important because each of these faiths recognizes that these are sacred spaces, sacred places where Jesus was, and so they set these places aside as important and that they're sacred. In Hawaii, the nobles could not marry spouses of lower standing. So if you were the highest one of your tribe, who could you marry? It often forced them to marry their sister, or to have a relationship with their mother because they were the only females who were not of a lower stature. This also happened throughout Egypt that the pharaohs would have to marry their sisters and this is the cause of many talk uh, during those years with the birth defects that would come out and the mental instability that came from generations of inbreeding throughout Egyptian society. Tapu was a form is also a form of sacredness that was used in the Maori and Tahitian traditions. This also means that if there's a restriction or a pro prohibition. So if something was tapu, it meant that you stayed away from it. You couldn't undertake activities in those areas. So it was protected, it was protected by the gods, and therefore had to be treated with extreme care. Some translate tapu as sacred, and that means it has a consistently positive connotation. But tapu isn't always positive. Mana is positive, but tapu could also mean some negative connotations, that there might be some form of imbalance. So mana referred to positive. Tapu might be used in those circumstances, but, but could also be used in detrimental circumstances. For example, when a woman had her menstrual cycle, she was considered tapu, and she was unable to be associated with men during this period. Even today, women in the Rapa chain, in the, uh, Rapa in the Austral chain, have to prepare their food, but they can't prepare any of the men's food. This is the same thing that happened, with, for those of you who have read the stories of the Red Tent during the Hebrew scriptures in the Canaanite days, that women were kept aside during their menstrual period away from men because it was thought that the women's influence during this period was dangerous to the men. And I'm not going to comment. In one instance, we talk about Tapu, <clears throat> that there was a dog who was found digging into a grave site. And he started to chew on a bone, and they saw this dog chewing on the bone. And so they chased the dog because they had to do a ceremony to eliminate the Tapu from the dog. The dog ran into the river 
made the entire river tapu. And so consequently, they had to do, no one could use that water in the river until they did an entire ceremony to eliminate the tapu that the dog had placed on the river by chewing on a part of a corpse. It was that serious. There are rituals that cover many areas of life. Some of these rituals talk about a sorcerer, Mari, Marui, who called upon the gods to confuse the minds of some people so that they would walk over the cliffs. There are also uh, rituals for fertility, for hunting, for voyaging, or for fishing. Some of these will last for a short period of time. Others can last for days or even in Hawaii for months. The goal of these is to move the gods according to the human wishes. So there are three steps in a Polynesian ritual. Invite, inviting the gods to come and to take place in the ritual. Asking the gods to do their work. And then bidding the gods goodbye. And I would say to all of those of you who pray and who might be Christians, that the same thing takes place in a Christian prayer. We invite our God to be present to us. We ask our God for what we need and then we say goodbye to our God. It's the same triadic approach to prayer that occurs in many types of uh, cultures around the world. In Polynesia, they would also do these dances. They wanted to attract the gods, and understanding that these gods had human traits and might be attracted just like us, they would have women go out and do the hula dance to invite the god to come, and then they would, this was part of their, the, the God's understanding of their, God, their God's sexuality. And then at the place where they would have this, they would actually create perches where the gods would come and be present to enjoy the show that was happening. They would also leave gods, very common, even throughout Canaanite religion, Hebrew, even up through present times that we would leave gifts and give gifts. In fact, Jesus is, for Christians, is the great sacrificial gift that we say that Jesus was sacrificed so that we no longer had to sacrifice ourselves. We no longer had to lay burnt doves in, off, in incense and offerings, that Jesus was that sacrificial gift. And here we see these gifts being given throughout Polynesia too as a way of appeasing the God gods. So a war god might be given the gift of an enemy killed. Human sacrifices were common in many parts of Polynesia. The gods of agriculture might be given the first harvest, might be given other different gifts, but each of these gods, when they were called upon, was given a gift. Human lives were sacrificed on many occasions for the naming of high chiefs and for other important ceremonial events. And you'll even see here this man's hand. He's lost his fingers because he's cut his fingers off at the knuckle as a supplication to the God to restore his relatives to health. So when one of his children or his wife or his family members might have fallen sick, he would cut off one of his fingers at the knuckles as a sacrifice to bring health back to his family. Another way to influence the God was through incantations. And if you did an incantation wrong at any part, it would have to be started over again. And in some parts of Polynesia, if someone, women and children were not allowed to attend, you had to stay in the house, keep your lights out, and keep completely silent. And if an animal, a woman, or a child wandered into this happening, the nearest male relative of that person, of the woman or the child, would have to sacrifice that woman or child on the spot to the gods. Dismissals. So after the gods had done their work, they would ask the gods to leave. And it's important to understand that these gods had to be asked to leave because if they didn't, they would still have this tapu on the crop. So when the god comes, the God makes everything tapu. You can't touch that crop now. If it's in the warrior field, you can't go out in the field of battle. So now you have to ask the God to leave and you have to say the prayer to ask the God to go away and to remove the tapu, to remove the curse from that land. One of the most common agents for this purpose through, throughout Polynesia was water. They would use salt water or fresh water to remove the curse. And for those of you who are familiar with baptism, baptism is water that is used to remove the stain of original sin. 
So again, we see these similarities. And the question is, how is it that they're so similar? What is it, for those of you who believe in God, that God is speaking to us through these events throughout all time? And there's this thread that binds all of us together. And for those of you who may not be theists, the idea is, what is it that connects these elements to all people throughout these times? And Carl Jung had this theory of archetypes, that there's a thread that binds all of us from the most ancient times until today, Animals would call it instinct. Jung calls it this archetype theory. Fire was another way to release people and things from taboo. In many churches today, we use the idea of incense, the removal of, uh, of, of these sorts of things through curse. It's a, it's a um, purification ritual that incense is used to purify the house of God. In the same way fire was doing the same thing, fire would be reused to remove a God from an element. So if they found a diviner stone in a field that was meant to cause a curse, they would take the stone out and throw it on the fire and that would expel the demon. There were some rites of passage as well that were important. As a child was born, they would cut the hair of the godparents, if you will, the parents of um, both sides of the family, and they would make ornaments that, these peop that the child would wear later on in life. Tattoos were often very important parts of uh, these rituals as well. They carry symbolic meanings. And tattoo, again, is very much popular and alive in New Zealand. One of these rituals was a fattening ritual where the children would be kept inactive and out of daylight and fattened to make them more attractive. I've been doing that for years. And what I can tell you is it doesn't make you more attractive. In the Marquesas, death was accompanied by the wailing of women, and women would also perform a specific dance called the Hiva. And the Hiva, they would harm themselves but they would also, in some societies, the heva was done to harm the person who had died. So they would, if a person who had died in a wrong sort of manner or was a, a warrior that was caught on the battlefield, they would mutilate the body of the person who had died. Christian missionaries saw these behaviors as pagan and found ways to stop them. And in closing, we'll talk a little bit about life after death. When a person is about to die, a soul goes off and warns others that he's about to die. In the same way, when a person is about to die, the ones who have left them come to them and tell them that it's just about your time. Prepare yourself and be ready. Uh, tie up your loose ends. And after a person dies, this person is said to linger around and that elder couples are said to have their, their partner with them if they're over the age of 70, that that partner never really leaves them that they're there with them until their last day. What a beautiful message of consolation that the ones who have died are never really far from us, that the world of the living is in continual communion with that of the dead. And for those of you who are Christian, this is the idea of the procession of the saints. This is also the idea of communion itself is that God is present with you in the communion, that when you receive him, he is a part of, of that sacrament. The positive relation was actually drawn in one of Paul Gauguin's paintings. You can see here the dead relative in the corner looking over the young one who is sleeping. That these relatives who had passed were never far and they could always be called upon to help with prayer. And in closing, I leave you with this thought. Our similarities bring us to a common ground but it's our differences that allow us to be fascinated by and with each other. And I'll leave you on that note. Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you.